Good morning. It's camp meeting time in Louisiana. I can't hear him say it again, but I can say it for him. And I'm happy to be here with all of you wonderful people. What a great night last night. You know, I don't know whether we realize it or not, but we witnessed last night a tremendous, a tremendous event because it begins a new day. The old days are gone and they were wonderful. But with my God, everything builds to something better. And today, this day, this new beginning is gonna be greater than anything we've ever seen. That's the way God does things. Thank you. You may be seated. And thank you, our new superintendent, Brother Weber, his wonderful wife, Sister Weber. Thank you to Brother Cox, wonderful man. To our wonderful district board, I give honor to all of these wonderful people and to my special family that means so much to me. Especially these last few years, they have meant so much. And then to my lane, my mentor, and to all of you wonderful people, to the wonderful ministers of Louisiana, you are great and wonderful people. And I give you respect, honor, and love today. I stand here where my husband stood so many times with a, a lot of emotions. I've done a lot of, every, a lot of things on this campground. In fact, I think I've done almost everything on this campground, from clean bathrooms to clean dormitories to work in the kitchen to, well, I'll tell you where I started. I started when there wasn't anything on these grounds, but seven men looking around to see where to build a tabernacle. My dad was on that first board. And when they came down to look it over, I came with him. We stood over there where the dining room is. I was about 11 years old. And we looked around and they decided that's where it would be. And then I was here when those wonderful board members made the cinder block by hand. And as they dried, they stacked them up and we had our first tabernacle. I've been around a long time. I've, I've been around a long, long time. And my first job on these grounds was to pick up the bottles, the Coke bottles. Now, there was a time when you returned all bottles. I know some of you can't believe that, but that's the truth. And somebody had to pick them up. And my dad was good at assigning us kids what to do. And that was my job every day. Every day during camp meeting, I made a round all over the place and picked up all the bottles. And then today, I stand before you as a Bible teacher. It's been a wonderful trip. It's been a wonderful trip. I'm grateful, so grateful to be here. Thank you, Brother Weber and the district board for this opportunity. In 1952, Florence Chadwick stepped into the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island, determined to swim to the shore of mainland California. The weather was foggy and chilly. She swam hard for 15 hours and then exhausted, begged to be taken into the boat. Her mother leaned forward and said, you can make it. It's not that far, you can make it. So she swam on until finally, totally exhausted, she just quit swimming. They hurriedly took her into the boat, wrapped her in warm blankets, and then as she was losing the chill, the fog lifted and she was less than half a mile to the shore. Later in a news conference, she said this, all I could see was fog. I think if I had seen the shore, I could have made it. Folks, we're nearing the shore. 
We're nearing the shore. If you can clear the fog, you can make it. My subject today is heaven. Now, don't expect this to be a scholarly study. It's not. It's one pilgrim talking to another. I'm a traveler. I'm traveling with you. And they tell us that a big part of enjoying a vacation or any trip is the anticipation of it, the planning of it. Don't forget to enjoy the looking forward to. It's going to happen one of these days, and we're going to see him as we have always said. So today, my subject for you is just heaven. You know, have you ever heard of exploratory surgery? It's where the surgeon knows there's something there, and he's not quite sure what, but he knows there is something, and so he goes in in a spirit of exploratory and discovery. Well, that's kind of what I'm doing today. This is exploratory teaching. I've never been to heaven, but I'm planning on going. And I want to enjoy the trip. So let's talk about what it's going to be. You know what? We know a whole lot more. I'm afraid we do know a whole lot more about the end times and the terrible things that are coming than we do about the joy of heaven that's awaiting us all. And what a difference in your mental attitude if you lift, lift your eyes above all of the things that are going to happen on this world and know you're going to get out of here and it's going to be glorious one of these days. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above. There's one translation that says this, Let heaven fill your thoughts. What a difference if we can lift our eyes and let heaven fill our thoughts. I know the scripture says that no eye has seen, no ear heard, all of this, but you forget to read the next verse. But it has been revealed to us. He didn't leave us in doubt about where we're going. He told us enough about it to get me very excited at least. So heaven, where is it? Is it real? What's it like? Are there people there? Let's do a little exploratory teaching and talk about it. It's the ultimate place, but what is it really like? It seems that the death of my husband has put me on a, a, a course of thinking more about heaven, and I think that would be a normal thing. And it made me want to know more about it. Let me tell you just a little bit about what happened when my husband died. You all shared his life. You deserve to know how he died. He was not really sick very long. You know he had broken his leg. And he found out that he had broken it again and was in for another long siege of rehabilitation and all kind of problems. So being a prophet, he dismissed his spirit. He was fine at 7.30 that morning. When I talked to him, we made plans for the day. He was getting ready to go to therapy. When he got into therapy, they told him the problem and what was facing him. He left therapy and went back to his room. And in just a few minutes, he started getting very nauseated. By the time I got there about 10 o'clock that morning, he was very sick. Sitting in his recliner, the nurse was with him. The head nurse soon came in. About 12 o'clock, we moved him from the recliner back to his bed. It was propped up, and he was kind of slumped a little to the right. Terry and I were there. Tommy was preaching a funeral. We were laying across the bed talking to him, right there with him when his breaths became more shallow, less frequent. And then all of a sudden, he took a very deep breath, drew in a deep breath. It was kind of shocking. And as that breath escaped his lungs, he said this, I am in the presence of God. And dropped his head as he stepped on that celestial shore to meet his Lord. If I never believed in it before, a dying man don't, don't lie. And if I had never believed in it before, I would have felt very certain that that's where he was. 
But what a beautiful testimony to me and to you that the man that we loved and that served God and served us so faithfully for so many years announced his home going and where he was. I am in the presence of God. From that day forward, I have been so interested in knowing more about that place we call heaven. It, uh, Brother Barnes always taught us that there's only a tissue paper wall between this world and that other world. And that if that tissue paper is torn, you immediately can see into that other world. You know, we, we, we kind of refer to the afterlife. I'm not sure that's the proper way. Maybe this is the pre-life. And that's the real life. Because that's the life that will never pass away. So I have been very interested in knowing that. And you know, this tissue paper thing that's there, you remember the boy with the prophet Elijah? All of a sudden, what he had seen as the enemy surrounding them, his eyes were opened and he saw the heavenly forces of God as they surrounded him completely. They were there all the time. He just didn't have eyes to see into that eternal place. And so I believe that we have a much closer proximity to heaven than what we really think. You know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the, the, the disciples stood there and in one moment they saw Moses and Elijah from many years past. I'm telling you, the future is much closer than you think it is. And the eternity is more real than the time we're living in. It's all in the scripture. I have a friend named Lois Rice. I was talking to her about my studies about heaven. And she said, let me tell you what happened with my mother. She said, my mother had been a faithful saint of God for many years. She lay there dying with her eyes closed. And suddenly she said, she opened her eyes and said, mama, as if she had just walked in the room and saw her mother who also had served God faithfully. You've heard many, many stories, I have and so have you, about how close it really is. But let me just tell you that it's closer than your breath. It is more real than the hand in front of my eyes. Heaven is real. Heaven is here. Heaven is around us. We just aren't fixed to see it yet. God is here and he has prepared a place for his people. And someday we'll all take our last breath and open them and say, I am now in the presence of God himself. It's a real situation. Is it a real place? The scripture says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. It is a prepared place. It is a place. That word originally comes from the word topos, from which we get our word topography. It means a locatable place on a map. Heaven is real. It is not just a figment of our imagination that somebody has told us about. It is a real place. There are many mansions, and one, one translation says there are many dwelling places. Dwelling places are not dwelling places without dwellers. There are people there. there it is an actual place. It is a place of mansions. It is something physically real and we are going there someday. So where is heaven? Heaven is up. Acts chapter 1, verse 11, 9 through 11, tells us that Jesus was taken up in the clouds. And the, the angel said unto them, Why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Heaven is up. Even the devil knew that because he said, Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
So you see, it's way up there somewhere, but it's real, folks. It's real. And I, when you think about what heaven really is, it's God's dwelling place. It's his home. It's where he lives. And it's in the sky somewhere above the clouds and somewhere above the stars. So is there more than one heaven? Yes, there is. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. It was made on the second day of creation. The second heaven is the outer space where the planets and the stars. On the fourth day of creation, that was made. And then there's the third heaven. And that is where God's abode is. Paul was caught up, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body. God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul actually was transported into the third heaven, which is God's abode. Now, I talk about this from Paul's advantage. But if I am a believer in what Paul taught, and he taught that we would all be caught up to meet him in the air, I'm going where Paul's already been. And I'm going not before too long I'm going. Believe me, I am. So Paul was caught up to the third heaven, and then there perhaps, you know something that has bothered me, I mentioned it to Sister Mangan the other day. Paul was told not to talk about it. Don't say anything about it. John went to where God's abode was, and he was told to write it all down. I wonder what Paul really saw. You know, heaven is such a mystery, but it's a wonderful mystery. It's something that gives us something to look forward to. Do you ever just sit and think about heaven? What it's going to be like when you get there, there's not going to be any problems, no sin, no worry, no tiredness, no sickness, no devil, no, no bad people, no sin. It's going to be something wonderful. It's going to be worth it all if we can just get there. And then there's a fourth heaven. Now, remember, I'm teaching you about heaven today. The fourth heaven is going to be when that, the old earth and heaven pass away. And he said there will be a new heaven and a new earth. First, Second Peter chapter 3 gives us a look into that. But the heavens of the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. You know this scripture. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be destroyed, dissolve what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation. If you can touch it, it's going to be burned up. Your checkbooks, your property, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I don't even understand all this. I don't understand how it's going to happen, how that it's going to be burned up and cleansed with fire and still be a new one. I don't understand it. But I do believe it because I said, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That's why you better not get too attached to what you've got here. I thank God for the little house that I have that I'm living in. But I'm going to tell you, I will work, weep one tear when it goes up in smoke because I'm going to be living on the celestial shores somewhere with Jesus Christ, my husband, and all the saints that have gone before. Just don't get too attached to these worldly goods. It's not worth it. It's all going away. And not only is there going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you know, we're just talking about the trip today. I'm a pilgrim. You're a pilgrim. We're travelers. We're on our way to heaven. We're just struggling along over the rocky roads that we walk sometime, and we're talking about where we're going. Are you excited about getting there? I think of my little kids, my children when they were little, my grandkids, and now my great-grandkids. You know what they're always saying? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much further is it? Sometime I just look up to Jesus and say, how much longer is it? I want to go. I'm ready to go. I want to enjoy that wonderful place that you've prepared for me. 
And then it's not only a new heaven and a new earth, it's going to be a new Jerusalem. And the scripture says in Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light. And it says that it was coming down from heaven. John writing said, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I cannot even imagine what it's going to be like. It's, do you know it's going to happen? You know, this, this kind of blows your mind. You can't really kind of take it all in. But one of these days, there's going to be a wonderful city of God that is going to descend. I don't know. Some scholars believe it's going to station itself over what is now Israel. I don't know where it's going to be. But I intend to be there. That's what I'm aiming for. I'm on a trip today. I'm taking my journey today, but I'm headed for a city whose builder and maker is God, and it will never, ever pass away, and the glory of it is unbelievable because of what, how wonderful it is. It's the capital city. You know, we're all pilgrims. I've told you that. Abraham spent his life looking for a city. Why should I mind spending my life looking for it? He found it, and I'm going to find it too, believe me. He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the, in, in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. John called it the city of God. It's being built now. But it's going to be relocated because the scripture tells me, and I take the scripture at face value, it's going to descend somewhere from out of the heavens. What a glorious spectacle that's going to be when the new Jerusalem starts descending and somebody's going to witness it, folks. I intend to be in the crowd that's waiting to watch that thing as it comes down out of God. Now let's talk a little bit about that new Jerusalem. You know, I have a, a little grand, great-granddaughter. Uh, I call her my great-granddaughter, Caitlin. She just got married, and last night she was telling me they're moving into their new house. and I'm getting married, too, again. Don't lose your breath. <laughs> this bridegroom even exceeds the one I had before. I'm going to marry Jesus Christ. I'm going to be his bride. And right now, he is preparing a house for me, and I'm going to live there forever and forever. It's not a fairy tale. It's real. And it's going to happen because we are headed for heaven someday. Let's talk about that city. It's a 1,500-mile cube. That means it's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. And according to the average floor of a skyscraper that we know is 12 feet high, a mathematician figured this all out. I certainly didn't. He says there could be as many as over 600 stories in that one city. It's bigger than you think. If you're thinking about Alexandria or Shreveport or Lafayette about a city, that's not even... a. a a pebble in the backyard of that wonderful city. It's the new Jerusalem that is built by God. The average uh, tallest, uh, the tallest building in the world today is in Dubai, and it's only 2,717 feet high, which is very high. It is 104 stories. This city is 1,500 miles high. If you want a little idea of how big that is, you can go from California to the Appalachian Mountains for 1,500 miles. You can go from Canada down to Mexico for about another 1,500 miles. And then if you stack it up a 1,500 miles high above that, that, my friend, are the dimensions of the New Jerusalem. Now, when I heard this preached when I was a kid, 
I wondered how in the world he could build a heaven big enough to get us all in. But I think he's got that solved. Because, as I told you, a mathematician figured out a whole lot of this. Not me. But the scripture says that it, they gave these measurements. The angel measured it. But it said it was measured according to the measure of a man. So it means that what the measurements are given us are measurements that we can understand. And that 1,500-mile cube is going to be the most glorious thing you have ever imagined. We're going to talk about it. First of all, it's got walls. The walls are of jasper. Beautiful, beautiful stone of jasper. Do you know how big those walls are? They are 72 yards wide, according to what the Bible tells us about the walls. That's three-quarters the length of a football field. We think too little. God's got some big things in mind for those that serve him. Oh, it's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. It's going to be worth it all. It's not just a figurative thinking. It is actual. It is real. Is it hard to believe that we could have this and that the things of, of God are going to be that real? Not if you have the idea that God is bigger than anything a man could ever imagine. We, we don't even know how to talk or think about those kind of things. And then it has 12 foundations. And they're all of precious stone. Can you imagine how gorgeous that will be? I remember my husband saying very often, if the apostles' names are in those foundational stones and they can hold up the new Jerusalem, then their doctrine is strong enough to help me make it through. I thank God for the apostles' doctrine, and their names are in the foundations of that wonderful city. You can't even begin to imagine how beautiful it is. One mathematician that I read after in studying some of these things about heaven said it should be able to accommodate 20 billion residents. Did y'all hear that? When I was a kid, I used to worry about how, how if, if heaven was going to be big enough. It's going to be big enough. This mathematician said it could accommodate 12, 20 billion residents if each has 75 acres. Heaven's big. The new Jerusalem itself is big. And that's not all there is to it. There's a new heaven and a new earth. Quit thinking so little. Your God is big. And the story of creation and looking around at what, if you, if you can't imagine all that, just look at creation, how God did it. And he, did, he didn't even struggle with it. He just spoke it all into existence. So he's big enough to do all of this too. It, it, it just, it, it's amazing to me. But Revelation chapter 21 says, He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, but clear as crystal. And it had a wall, great and high, and it had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb and he that talked with me had a golden reed and he measured the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall there 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The finest foundation, first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh crystallite, 
the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrys I don't even know what this one is, chrysoprasosis or something, and the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were pearls. Each, every gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was of pure gold, as though it were transparent. Breathtaking, breathtaking. It's real, it's being prepared. It's getting ready to come down. His bride is gonna live there. Is anybody excited about going to heaven? We build a nice building down here and thank God we have some wonderful buildings. But your eye hath not seen nor your ear heard what is prepared for those who love him and who are faithful to him. And it's nearer than we can imagine. Oh, 12 gates of pearl, walls of jasper, no temple there, no sun, no moon. He is the light. There's a river there that flows with wonderful water from under the, under the throne of God. There are trees there. I, I, I just cannot imagine how beautiful that place is. I have been singing for days now that old song, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. Sweet home of the blessed and free. It's, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. And now let me tell you something else about it. And I don't even understand all this. I'm not even going to try to explain it to you because I don't understand it. And I'm not sure anybody else knows all about it. I don't know exactly what's going to be happening on the new earth, but there's going to be a new earth. And listen to this. According to Revelation 21, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Talking about the light of the new Jerusalem. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it the nations the kings of the nations bringing glory into the new Jerusalem the new earth new Jerusalem and then we're going to be promised that we will rule and reign over that earth I'll get to that in a minute do you suppose that the devil thought he had really thrown God a curve when he messed up Eden. Do you suppose that heaven, the new earth, and all of this is going to be a whole lot like Eden was intended to be? All of this is going to happen after the culmination of all things, Armageddon, the tribulation, the two judgments. It's going to be real, folks. There are going to be nations to be ruled, we're going to be doing some things. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But let me ask you this. Are there people there? Where are the saints who have died? Where are they now? This is very familiar scripture, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and without rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether we present or absent, we may be accepted of him. If you're absent from the body, Paul says, you are present with the Lord. That's why my husband announced to me where he was. I am in the presence of God, at home with the Lord. Your loved ones who have served him faithfully, and have gone on, they are now enjoying the personal presence of being with Jesus Christ himself. Because when you're absent from the body, you are present with the Lord. Present means present. You're there. They are there. So to be absent from the body means that we will be present with the Lord at home with him. You know, life is terminal. We're all going to die. Have no fear of death if you're, if you're walking with God. Death is just a passage away. 
death only lasts for a little while, just a few seconds sometime. My husband only had a few seconds of what you would really call death. So why do we fear it? We should be rejoicing that we are going on home to be with him. I understand we are all human, we're nature, uh, our human nature. But I, I'm not going to let myself dwell on that. I am anxious to go beyond death. Death is just a temporary moment because what's waiting on the other side is going to be so much better. Because for a believer, death is not a termination of life. It is just a transition. You know, I know I may be a little bit weird, but sometimes I just sit around and think about it. Wonder what my husband's doing right now. Wonder what Delisa's doing. They're alive. They are fully aware. They're in the presence of God himself. It's, it's not a, a forever sleep. It's not forever in the ground. It, it, it's, it's a new life. It's a new way of thinking. It's everything going to be wonderful. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Paul said one time that he would desire to depart. He said, I desire to depart and be with Christ. That word depart is a pictorial word. It actually showed, if you have a picture of what the word depart meant, it showed a boat loosing the rope from one pier as it moved to another pier. You just move from one life to another life. And this life is nothing but trouble and problems and messed up. But we're going to one of those places that God has it pre prepared for all of those who are faithful to him. And it's going to be perfect, so perfect we cannot even begin to imagine it. Jesus said, you know, you're talking about, we're talking about what happens when they die right now. Jesus said to the thief, today, not next week or next year or after the millennial, today. You're going to be with me in paradise. Today. That means one second after you draw your last breath, if you've been a faithful servant of God, you're going to be with him. With him. I just can't, I can't, even, I can't even begin to comprehend it. Stephen, when he was stoned, looked up and saw Jesus in the heavens and said, receive my spirit. It's going to happen in an instant. It's really going to happen. And we will be changed in a moment, either by death or by rapture. It will happen in a split second. You'll take one breath of this air, and the next breath will be celestial from the wonderful place called New Jerusalem and the heaven of God. So now, the third heaven, spirit, our body, where it's going to be, your body is going to be there. Now, what do we have when, when a person dies? Do they have a body right now? Or are they just a spirit floating around somewhere? I don't know, and neither does anybody else. Most scholars believe there will be a temporary body of some sort because when God created man, he made him three parts, body, soul, and spirit. But whatever it is, I'm going to like it, and it's going to be good. I don't, know, I don't know if they have bodies right now or not, but I know one thing. They're going to have a glorified body eventually because after the rapture, our body will be like his body. We will be in a glorified body. We will have a body like his. And he had quite a body. He was recognizable. He walked through walls and doors. He ate. He talked with people. Now, that's after death. So why do I fear death? It's going to be better after I get through it. You know, just get through it. Let's get through this life. Get it over with. John and Paul were caught up and they saw the third heaven. The thief was there, Jesus said, today. The unbeliever's destiny is going to be just as horribly unbelievably bad as what we're talking about today is gloriously wonderful. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I want to go to heaven. So what are we going to, let me talk a little bit about what we're going to do in heaven. 
if you think heaven is floating around on a cloud for a million years with a harp, <laughs> I might not want to go. That sounds so boring to me. And I don't even like to be still very long. I like to be doing something. I cannot imagine the boredom of a million years floating on a cloud strumming on a harp. <laughs> so I got news for you. We're going to worship and we're going to work. Because work is rewarding. But the thing about work is you'll never get tired. You won't have this old body to drag around that gets tired and gets sick. We're going to be doing something we enjoy. You know, the reason we can believe this is because what God started with. And I don't think the devil has thwarted his plans completely. The devil has never thwarted God's plans. He messed up Eden, but God's got something better than Eden. And it's coming, it's waiting for me and you to get there. And he charged them to have fellowship with him and to work and keep the garden and to rule over the garden. And so from what I have studied from most scholars, they think that's going to be somewhat of a part of the new Jerusalem and the, the new earth. It's going to be something like Eden where we will work, but we will enjoy our work. We will never tire. There will be no curse, and it will be forever wonderful, and you'll be doing something that you're equipped to do because God put you there. Now, God said God ended his work and rested. He, he didn't rest because he was tired. He stopped to observe what he had done. So if that is any indication, we'll just work and then stop to see what we've done and go do something else. You know, it's going to be a wonderful place. Am I, are y'all understanding what I'm talking about? I don't want to be bored. I don't like to be bored. I like to be accomplishing something. And if God did everything he did with this earth, I just cannot imagine what he is going to do with us. We're going to be us when we get there. We're going to be us. Your same gifts and desires, what you are now, you're going to be you and I'm going to be me. We're going to know each other. Job said, in my flesh, I shall see God. That means me. When I get there, I'm going to see you. It's going to be a wonderful thing. We're just not going to have all the other problems that we've got. So we're going to be us, and we're going to know things. We're going to know people. We're going to know those that we've gone on before. In my flesh, Job said, I will see God. And then, and I think a lot of us will like this, I think we're going to eat and drink. And I got scripture for it. Luke 22, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a real place, folks, with real people going to be there. Will we know each other by our names? Matthew 8, Jesus said, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's names. We're going to be there. We're going to be like him. We're going to eat. We're going to drink. We're going to know each other by name. Will we wear clothes? Revelation 3 says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. The overcomers were clothed in white garments. How old will we be in heaven? Sister Mangan, we ain't going to be in our 80s and 90s <laughs> with a creaking old body that's about worn out. Now, I have no scripture for this, but those who have studied, those who have made it a, a life study to understand the, these things of the scripture, they think that we will all be probably in our 30s. Yay! And they base that on the fact that Jesus began his ministry when he was 30, 
about the Levites and the priests and the, the rules of those things. And 30 is the perfection of age. That they, those that, that study that kind of stuff say that your 30s are the perfection of your life as far as your physical body. I'll take it, will you? And so God is going to call us all home. Heaven's going to be wonderful. Heaven's going to be wonderful. It's a real place. It's more beautiful than you can ever imagine. There's nothing that will hurt nor destroy there. No mosquitoes. The viper won't bite. The lamb and the lion are going to lie down together. Now, is that in the New Jerusalem? Probably on the New Earth. I mean, you can really get into some deep water with this. I'm just a traveling pilgrim talking to somebody else, trying to tell you where I'm going. I'm on my way, folks. Are you on your way? This old body gets tired. But someday I'm going to lay this old body down. I'm not going to balance another checkbook. I'm not going to worry about another sick person. I'm not going to have another terrible night of restlessness and worry and concern. Everything is going to be perfect. I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. My body is going to be like his body. I'm going to be with the saints of old. I've got some questions I want to understand. I'm, I'm going to meet some of the saints from the years gone by. I'm going to be with my husband again. I'm going to walk on streets of gold. I'm going to live in a mansion. I am going to praise and worship the Lord forevermore. I'm going to heaven. I'm going there when I die. I'm going to heaven in the sweet, sweet by and by. You need to think about heaven every day, every day. And I just got one question as I close today. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, will you be there to answer your name? <laughs> On that bright and cloudless morning, when the saints of God shall rise, we shall all rise to meet him in the air. It is not a story. It is not a fable. It is the word of God. If you have trusted him for your salvation, you can trust him to believe that everything I have said to you and far more than I could ever explain is going to really happen one of these days. And we're going home to be with him. Will you answer? When your roll is called up yonder, will you answer with his name? Going to be a heaven's jubilee someday. God bless you. I'm going to meet you in heaven one of these days. <laughs>